Okay, everyone, now we move into section 4.3 and we finally start to make some connections, more connections. We've at least made a few, but now we finally start to get to see how everything really combines, how the ideas of area, integral, and antiderivative are related. But we still have a few little steps to get there. The first thing we have to do before we can start talking about the fundamental theorem of calculus, which two quick things here, that we're actually covering a section called the fundamental theorem of calculus. I hope that really, really establishes what a crucial section this really is. And as we use that, as that's quite a mouthful, I'll abbreviate that FTC when it comes up again. So the fundamental theorem of calculus. There's two parts to this, and we have to start with the ideas before we can even get to the first part. So what happens at the very beginning of this section is that we basically have to define a little bit of a new function, that we're going to define a function g of x, but I'm going to define that function as the definite integral of another function. Now, just a little bit for notation. You see, I almost had a little goof here. I'm using x as the variable for the g function, and then that x is coming up here as one of my bounds. But now I can't use x inside of here anymore, so that's why I made that a t. So I have f of t dt. But it's just to have a different variable, everybody. So how does this new function work? Well, let's remember some of the ideas of functions. All a function really is, is a rule so that we know when you give me an x, when you give me a particular input, how do I find or what is the output that goes with that input? Well, watch how this works here. That if I had a function f of t, so again, just some generic picture for that function, and a is some specific spot, and now, give me an x value. So for this example, generically, let's pretend that a equals 1, and I ask you to find what is g of 2. Well, I'd go to my picture. The input is 2, so I would actually look at the integral, so the area under the curve, from 1 to 2. And that number, whatever that area is, would be the y value that goes with that g. So I can now make a completely separate curve that goes with g based on this type of information. Another quick one, what if I ask you what is g of 1? Well, that would be the integral from 1 to 1 of f of t dt. And I, I should have brought this up when we were doing the properties. This one is also worth pointing out. What is the area under a single point. If I go from A to A, well, there is no width. So there is height, but there is no width. No matter what way you want to look at this as a shape, you could think of this as a rectangle with height and a zero for its base, for its width, and that would have an answer of zero. So that now this x coordinate one has a y of zero, well, that is now a x intercept for the new g function. But just in general, that's the idea about this function, that I can set up this kind of an odd function, but it still makes sense. And there's a lot of properties we could talk about here. What do we want to know about regular functions? Well, the first thing is the definition. Here's an x, there's a y. I mean, I'm sorry, let me do one more here, point out a few little things. If I said, what's g of zero? Well, now I'd have the integral from one to zero. So now I'd be looking for this area over here, but my bounds are out of order, so that this would be a positive area traditionally, but my bounds are out of order, so I'd actually get a negative something here. So again, all those other properties for integrals are still coming up, but the first most basic thing is if you're given an x, well, you've got a way to plug that in to this integral, and that this integral represents some value, some area, and that that is then the y for this. So the areas from this picture become the y's in the g graph. So here, 
I'd have an x-intercept at one, like we saw here. Whatever this is would be positive, so I'd have a point up here when x is two. This would end up being negative something down here, so there's a bunch of points. If I start using x values to fill in, I could fill in even more points. A little bit more about properties. The beginning of calculus, we talked about how important continuity is. Well, how do we know about the continuity of G? Well, as long as F is continuous here, we'll get smooth changes. So from like 2 to 1.9 to 2.1, well, 1.9 would have an area just less than this. So a point just below this. 2.1 would have an area just bigger than the area up to 2. So a point just above it. So again, the continuity here would lead to continuity here. And now we're ready to make our first point, everyone. What about the derivative? How do we take the derivative? How do we get g prime here? And this is formally Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, part one. That in this very, very basic form, that if I have function g defined in this very basic form, then the derivative of g is the f function with now variable x instead of t. That may not seem like a very big deal, but what that is trying to get us closer to is essentially you took the derivative on this side, so you got your g prime, and now you took a derivative of an integral, and in essence, everybody, these canceled. So this is actually trying to connect the idea that a derivative cancels an integral. Well, back in 3.9, we already realized that a derivative undoes an antiderivative, so this is starting to get the connections back, that the derivative undoes an antiderivative, and that an integral is an antiderivative. But this is just a sh shortened version of part one, and our book kind of sticks with this. Eventually, they use a more difficult version, but let me write it out more formally. I'm actually a little bald that our book does not write this out a little more formally. So this is the idea, but let's take it a little bit further. If g of x is equal to this integral, but now this is going to look a little ugly, because instead of a generic a and an x, both of these can have components of x. So more notation, it's going to look a little ugly. I'm going to get an a of x here and a b of x here. And what this tells me, the formal full statement of Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 1, if you have this as your original function, then when you go to take the derivative of that function, it's not just f of x. You would literally plug the b of x in for t, so you'd get f of b of x, but you'd also need the derivative of b. This is actually some aspect of chain rule. I'll come back and point out this in just a few minutes, but that's kind of what's going on here. And then we'll get a minus, and then I'll plug the bottom expression in, so I'll get f of a of x times the derivative of a. And that's an a, not a zero. And just to be clear, that integral was up here. That's the end of the fundamental theorem part one. Now, let's go back to the more basic version and realize how all of this does lead to this. That if I applied this to this, the x goes in for t the way b of x was going in for t. So I get f of x, and then I get the times the derivative of this x. But a derivative of a plane x is times 1. So this becomes f of x times 1, which is f of x, minus, then the a would get plugged in for t, so I get minus f of a times the derivative of a. But in this setting, a is just a number, so the derivative of a would be zero. So I got f of x times one minus f of a times zero, and that connects me back to f of x. So while we're here, again, this really seems like we did a very big detour in a lot of ways, but this idea helps
And then formally, why do we do this right now? Technically, fundamental theorem of calculus part one is used to prove fundamental theorem of calculus part two, and that is really the big thing that we are going to use. So let me just come back, but while we're here, while we have this, let's immediately take advantage. So here's fundamental theorem of calculus part one. If you have this, then this is its derivative. So let's find the derivative and let's do two weeks. Number one, let's find the derivative of x cubed minus 6x dx from 1 to x squared. And then number two, oh, I'm sorry, everybody. I need t's here. I'm very, very sorry. I can't overuse the x's. t cubed minus 6t dt. I'm very sorry about that from 1 to x squared. And then number two, we'll find the derivative of, we'll go from 4x minus 1 to cosine x, and this one will do t squared plus 1 dt. So notice, I didn't even give you the g notation. I'm just giving you a derivative. I'm sorry, giving you a definite integral and telling you to find the derivative. If I had this as a, I could say find a prime. If this is b, find b prime. So I'm taking the derivative of this. Taking the derivative of this. So you're taking a derivative of a definite integral. That's what we've got here. So it's almost like I'm kind of skipping this notation, but jumping us right to here, take the derivative of this. So apply this idea. The top gets plugged in for your function. So I'm getting x squared cubed, and I already cleaned that up. That's x to the sixth, minus six times t, but the x squared goes in place of t. That would be the f of b x part. Plugging that expression in for all the t's times the derivative of that top. So that'll be times a 2x. Minus. Now I'll plug the bottom in for t. I mean, some people will realize I'm gonna take the derivative of one at the end. I'm gonna get a time zero. So they could already, you know, just shortcut that. But I really wanna be very full in this first problem to use all aspects, not just to see one quick generic example and leave it up to you to realize chain rule would be necessary for this harder version, just literally changing x to x squared for some extra work here. So I think that's good just to realize. Let's always get in the habit of using this when we're trying to take the derivative of something like this. So plugging in the one, I get one cubed minus six times one, times the derivative of one, which is zero. And now, you know, find the derivative as I've always had. I would say you don't have to simplify your answer. So this is good. But of course, that's minus five times zero. That's all just zero. And this is so simple to multiply out. Two X to the seventh minus 12 X cubed. And even after I show you the second piece of the fundamental theorem, we'll come back and see how, again, how that works. How an alternative way just using the second part of the fundamental theorem. But it's worth knowing the first. Now, number two, same idea. Just going to give myself a little room so I could fit this in. So plugging in the top function, I get cosine squared plus one all times the derivative of cosine, so negative sine, minus, but now I'm gonna write more of my answer here, this goes in, so I get the quantity, 4x minus one squared plus one, all times the derivative of the 4x minus one, so just times four. And Again, yeah, there's a little bit you can do here. You could distribute that if you want, but nothing major happens. The minus four, well, before you distribute that, you'd have to do some FOIL here. So again, that is a good answer. We could do a lot of different distribution, but that's just fine. 
And even though this looked like a pretty ugly function, it still worked out pretty nicely because it's just a very easy application as long as we know the first part of the fundamental theorem. So now, as we go to page two, what is the second part then? So fundamental theorem of calculus, part two. And our book gives each of these separately and then gives them listed together. But this is the major one that we are gonna use a lot. Fundamental theorem part one, again, the reality of mathematics. It was necessary to prove part two but, you know, again, as far as everyday application, part two gets used significantly more. And what it tells us is that if we want to solve a definite integral, right? If we want to solve a definite integral, what we are getting here is our shortcut. So we already have established the definite integral as the area under f of x from x equals a to x equals b, and that's all we had. And any of the definite integral problems that we solved, we are either reliant on being given information to use some properties, or we relied on the function being easy enough that there's some way to graph it and use geometric ideas, area of rectangle, area of triangles, things of that nature. But now, now we get that the definite integral of f of x dx equals capital F of x with this bar and the a and the b now move to the end of this bar. And then we get one more line. I plug the b into capital F minus, and then I plug the a into capital F. And now we have to remember what the heck is capital F compared to little f? And we remember that capital F is the antiderivative of little f. And now we've connected all the dots, everyone. That is the main key. And I'm sorry, my finger smudged that, so I'll cross it off again. That is a minus. Capital F of B minus capital F of A. Some people just like to jump that the definite integral equals this, but I like to include this middle step because that's the reality when we solve problems, that we will need to do this. So before I do a problem using this, we're gonna go and redo some of the problems we did in the 4.2 video, and we'll do some new ones that we were unable to handle before. So we got a couple of good things going on. But, uh, but just before I do that, I want to point out, like I said, that now that we have this, now fundamental theorem part one makes a little more sense. And again, the reality is fundamental theorem part one is used to prove part two, but for our purposes, we can see how part two helps us to understand part one. So a quick little aside. So this is kind of a proof of fundamental theorem of calculus part one. So I am given g of x is equal to, I'm going to do the full thing, everybody, the definite integral a of x to b of x of f of t dt. And we want to find g prime of x. So that means I'm going to take the derivative with respect to x, I want f prime, uh, g prime of x, so the derivative with respect to x of the definite integral. And again, fundamental theorem part one tells us how to do that. Plug in the b for t times the derivative of b, minus plug in the a for t times the derivative of the a function. And if one of these is a constant, if they both, it all works out just fine. If there's no x here, if this is purely a definite integral and we go from one to three, well, the whole derivative is gonna equal zero because that integral would have represented a number. Even though that number represents area, it's still a number and a derivative of a number by itself is still zero. But now I'm gonna pretend I didn't know fundamental theorem part one and I'm gonna apply what we just learned right here. And this is gonna look a little ugly, but it's all, cause it's all generic notation. 
but you have the ability, you've had the tools to understand this. So I take this integral using this idea, and for right now, the derivative notation is just hanging out. So I want to take the derivative, but right now, it's kind of like order of operations. I'm working on the inside first. So I take this antiderivative of f of t, and I get capital F of t. And I've got that bar with the a of x and the b of x at the end. And now, still just pushing my derivative notation, I plug in the top, so I get f of b of x minus f of a of x. So all I did, I just formally used fundamental theorem part two, and the derivative notation is still hanging out. But now I'm actually gonna take the derivative. This may look ugly, and again, it's notation, but they're separated by subtraction, so I'll take each derivative separately. And even though this is ugly notation, this is the notation for chain rule, that I've got a function trapped inside another function. So how do I use chain rule? I take the derivative of the outer, so I will get capital F prime. Sorry for the horn, everybody, okay? Derivative of the outer, capital F prime, leave the inner alone, times the derivative of the inner, minus, same exact thing right here. Chain rule again, the capital F is the outer, capital F prime, leave the inner alone, times the derivative of the inner. And finally, capital F is the antiderivative of F, meaning that capital F prime takes us back to little f. So capital F prime of B of X is little f of B of X, and the B prime is still here, minus the capital F prime is little f of A of X, and the A prime is left behind. And there it is. The derivative of this equals this. And like I said, it's a little weird, but that's something that if you got a little lost, not to worry. Really, we need both parts, especially the second part. But again, I like to still show you this because it's a good practice in using the notation and realizing that yes, the second part can lead you back to the first. But now, now let's move on and let's get into a few problems. And we'll actually do this in a part two video.